Mom, something wrong? No. No, it's a sad movie. Joy, peace, harmony, togetherness. If these are the themes of Christmas, then why are so many Christmas movies so grim? It's a mood that filters through some of our greatest, if not our best known, Christmas movies. After all, Christmas, with its mix of Christian and pagan traditions, takes place near the winter solstice, the longest night of the year, and essentially a celebration of the death of light. We might view such grim tidings at the movies as a natural outgrowth of the Victorian custom of telling ghost stories at Christmas time. Charles Dickens is often credited with inventing the modern conception of the holiday with his 1843 novella, A Christmas Carol as a time of togetherness and family and goodwill toward men, but also one of facing one's demons before the start of the new year. The tradition of the Christmas ghost story was kept alive through the 19th century by such English writers as M. R. James, who read aloud his tales of curses and hauntings by candlelight every Christmas Eve to students at the universities where he served as provost. And Jerome K. Jerome, who wrote in 1891, there must be something ghostly in the air of Christmas. Something about the close, muggy atmosphere that draws up the ghosts, like the dampness of the summer rains brings out the frogs and snails. The custom of reading ghost stories at Christmas has largely died out, but traces of it can be found in movies, from Dead of Night and The Curse of the Cat People to Black Christmas and Gremlins. Then there are John Huston's The Dead and Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut, both Christmas movies preoccupied with mortality and incidentally those filmmakers' final works. Add to these the mournful Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas scene and Snowman Destruction from Meet Me in St. Louis, and the emotionally raw It's a Wonderful Life, and you've got a history of seriously bleak midwinters at the movies. Among the most beautiful and melancholy Christmas movies is Claude Jutra's Mon Oncle Antoine, which settles into your bones like a winter chill. Most of this Quebecois classic takes place on December 24th in a tiny mountain community. In lieu of Christmas bonuses, the boss of the local asbestos mine tosses cheap trinkets and candy to the families of his employees, an insult disguised as generosity, an anti-Santa Claus. Despite this, Christmas remains a time of celebration, as is clear from the excitement around the unveiling of the general store's holiday window display. Yet Mon Oncle Antoine is concerned with graver matters. On this day, an adolescent boy, Benoit, will quickly come of age. He must assist his uncle, the town's shopkeeper, as well as its undertaker, in transporting the corpse of a local 15-year-old. For Benoit, this boy is a doppelganger, a revelation of his own mortality. A death and a rebirth. It's a remarkably authentic feeling film. Just looking at one frame makes us realize how often we see artificial snow in movies. Here it is for real, muddy, slushy, gray rather than pure white. Ça fait toc. J'aime pas tellement la neige. Ça fait fou. Ça fait gosse. Eric Romare's My Night at Mods which also takes place largely over one long Yuletide night, is another film about an awakening. Jean-Louis Trintignant's protagonist, a pious Catholic, also named Jean-Louis, 
is invited by an old friend to dine with him at the apartment of a beautiful divorcee. An intellectual and sexual force, the open-minded woman, named Maud, turns out to present a formidable temptation for Jean-Louis, who is saving himself for marriage. Snowbound, he agrees to spend the night, but will he emerge morally unscathed in the harsh morning light of December 26th? With its odd little grouping of characters who barely know each other, a divorced mother and her daughter, two resolutely unmarried men, Romare's film must be one of the least family-oriented films to ever take place at Christmas time. Arnaud de Plachens A Christmas Tale is perhaps the ultimate epic of seasonal disorder, a spiked punch of bitterness, depression, illness, misery, and slapstick. The Vuillards are not merely dysfunctional, they're troubled in a gargantuan, generational, Tolstoyan way. Over the course of an extended Christmas weekend, long simmering resentments lead to fresh conflicts. Decades-old tragedies haunt new crises. The family has convened under one roof only because matriarch Junon, embodied by an imperious Catherine Deneuve, has been diagnosed with a rare form of cancer and requires a bone marrow transplant from one of her children or grandchildren. It's a psychologically fraught situation, made all the more combustible by the anxieties and expectations that are part and parcel of the holiday. The film deals at once with physical degeneration and spiritual and emotional regeneration. Everything feels imminent, on the threshold of revelation. Family is a force. No matter how much we may try to draw ourselves away, we're always drawn back. Desplechens film ends on a hopeful note, maybe even a miracle, but the characters' futures remain unsure. Perhaps the real question is not why are so many Christmas movies so sad, but why do we watch them? The fact is, even the darkest of Christmas movies offer a kind of catharsis. New Year's Day is a week away, but Christmas feels like the true culmination of the year. This is, after all, a holiday based on an epiphany. <laughs>